couple of uh, quick housekeeping items. Um, a recording of this will be available at the same link that you use to register um, after uh, Zoom is done processing the recording. So we'll share that out again after we're done. And then we are going to make the slides available as well um, in the Google presentation format. So you'll be able to look through the slides uh, if you would like. Uh, and then there's also a, a Q&A feature in Zoom. So you can ask questions and uh, feel free to start asking them whenever you would like. And we will start answering them at the end. We're gonna try to have probably like 10 or 15 minutes um, for questions at the very end. So please feel free to start asking your questions and keep them coming throughout. So we're we'll going to get started. Uh, the title of our webinar today is A Methodical Approach for Detecting Bloodhound. A couple of quick introductions. My name is Andy Robbins. I'm the Adversary Resilience Lead at Spectre Ops. What that means is I use Bloodhound to help our customers figure out how to cut down on all of these attack paths that the tool can find in a efficient and practical way. I am one of the co-creators of Bloodhound and you can find me on Twitter at that uh, link right there. Cool, and I'm, I'm Jared Atkinson. I'm the Adversary Detection Lead at Spectre Ops. I'm, uh, mainly in charge of kind of defining our technical direction for uh, how we approach defensive services or how we help consult with organizations on uh, their defensive detection and response program. Um, kind of background is I'm a PowerShell MVP uh, from Microsoft and I worked in the US Air Force before joining Spectre Ops. Um, you can find me at, at Jared C. Atkinson or Jared Katkinson, I guess on uh, Twitter. Quick agenda. So first of all, what do we mean when we say detect bloodhound? Because that's not exactly a, a clear cut, clear cut question. Uh, how sharphound works. Then we'll take a closer look at one of the particular collection methods in sharphound, which is session collection. And Jared will talk about through his uh, capability abstraction methodology, honing in on the session collection um, capability itself. So what do we mean when we say detect Bloodhound? So Bloodhound is an analysis tool. It doesn't actually do any attacks. Um, and just like any analysis tool, Bloodhound needs data to be able to provide any data uh, whatsoever. Imagine, a, imagine a, a map where you just have cities listed out. You wouldn't be able to navigate from one city to the other. And just like in Bloodhound, if you have no data in the database, then the tool itself provides no value whatsoever. So where does that data come from? Well, uh, the data for Bloodhound comes from Sharphound, which is the officially uh, supported and built and developed data collection tool, uh, which is developed by Rohan Vizerker, who is also on the presentation here as well. Um, so this is what Bloodhound looks like when you have lots of really good data. You can see shortest paths to domain admin. And this is what the tool looks like when you have no data whatsoever. So obviously, we need to have data um, in the database to be able to find attack paths, to be able to analyze how much privilege a certain user holds, how many admins there are for a given computer, um, how many people control a given Active Directory object, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, you're just looking at a blank screen, which is not very interesting. So let's talk a little more about how Sharphound works. Um, going through the preparation for this webinar, Jared brought up a good point, which is if you're going to detect something, you need to, you need to understand how it works. Um, otherwise, um, you're, you're going to have a, a necessarily naive approach no matter what you try to do. So let's talk about how Sharphound actually does its thing. So walking through the data collection architecture for how Sharphound gets its data from Active Directory, uh, including endpoints that are joined to Active Directory. So Sharphound typically will run on a system that has been compromised uh, in a red team engagement or a penetration test. And the binary itself is typically run either from disk or in memory um, using, uh, for example, execute assembly and Cobalt Strike. Sharpon collects a ton of data from domain controller, 
And it does that over uh, secure LDAP and through DNS. It also collects data from every computer that is joined to the domain. This is the default collection we're talking about. We're not talking about like kind of stealthy uh, uh, collection. And that, uh, that endpoint targeted collection, that happens uh, via RPC over SMB. And Jared is gonna talk more in detail about that in case you have any questions about how that works. Once the data is collected from the domain controllers or and the endpoints in the network, there will be a zip file that's generated and the operator, the red team operator, the pen tester, whoever, will take that zip and they'll drag and drop it into the Bloodhound client GUI. And then the client GUI will parse those files and then finally put that data into the database. And once that's, once that's done, you actually have data that you can analyze to find attack paths as a red teamer or as a blue teamer and try to shut down those attack paths if you're, if you're on the blue team side. So let's talk a little more about that first data collection piece we talked about, which is uh, targeting the domain controller via secure LDAP and DNS. So SharpHound's LDAP collection will by default collect info from one domain controller per run. And it uses secure LDAP by default. So instead of this traffic being targeted at port 389 on the DC, it's actually targeted at port 636. And because that traffic is encrypted, you are, you're gonna necessarily have to break that encryption to be able to read that traffic on the wire. Um, otherwise, you're just gonna be looking at encrypted traffic. Uh, so SharpHound, SharpHound accesses a uh, namespace called system.directoryservices.protocols, which is a, a lower level um, method of uh, accessing these, uh, these methods uh, than what you might see in other tools. Um, and so these methods are what we're actually using to interact with LDAP on the DC. Finally, uh, SharpHound reads a whole bunch of different information from the DC. And so it's going to read from object classes in this list. So you're going to see information about the domain head, OUs, user objects, computer objects, security groups, group policy containers, so GPOs, and MSDS uh, group managed service accounts, or GMSAs. And so SharpCon is going to read a lot of information from each of these different object classes. For example, from the security group object class, uh, it's going to be reading the members property, which is a set of distinguished names showing what are all the principles that have been added to that security group. Um, that information obviously is useful because of the way that uh, security group delegation works in Active Directory. If you belong to a security group and that group has certain privileges, then you, by virtue of belonging to that security group, also have those privileges. So next, let's talk a little more detail about how uh, SharpHound's uh, endpoint targeting data collection works. So when SharpHound is collecting data from computers in the environment, first of all, it needs to get a list of what those computers are. So it can get that list from LDAP, so from the uh, domain controllers. Um, it can get it from the local SharpHound cache that gets created after the first time you, uh, after the first time you run uh, SharpHound, um, or you can also you can provide a, an input file, uh, which is be, uh, be a list of computer names that SharpHound will then chew through. To check if uh, to check if a um, a computer is alive, uh, SharpHound. SharpHound doesn't ping the computer. It doesn't do a, an ICMP check. It actually checks to see if TC port, TCP port 445 is available. If it is available, then SharpHound will um, collect um, sessions from the computer, which it does with uh, a Win32 API function called net session enum. Um, or if you're doing privileged collection, it'll do net workstation user enum. Um, it'll also collect who are the members of the local security groups on that computer, uh, 
And it uses a Win32 API function called net local group get members to do that. If that TC port, TCP port 445 check comes back where 445 is not accessible, then Sharppound will skip that computer and move on to the next one. And that, that provides a lot of speed for Sharppound because if that port is not open, there's no point in trying to uh, execute these functions against that system. All of these API functions are executed via RPC over SMB. And we want to take a closer look at one of those in particular. We're going to take a closer look at session collection. So session collection is very valuable for us as an attacker, because if we can determine where privileged users are logged on in the network, and we can position ourselves so that we are an admin on that computer, then we can impersonate that user in several different ways. We could use Mimikatz perhaps to dump a clear text password for that user. Or if that doesn't work, we could just inject into a process where there's a, a primary token um, for that user and then um, authenticate as that user across the network. So this information is very, very valuable for us on the, on the red team side. So session collection, it tells us where users are logged on and what computers are logged on to. And like I said, if we could become an admin on that computer, we can impersonate users logged on to that system. And when we do the default unprivileged method, that uses the API function net session enum. So here's the, uh, the TechNet documentation for that function, if you want to go read it. Um, we actually, we use um, uh, level 10 uh, privileges, which are domain authenticated privileges um, when we call this function. And the information we get back from that is uh, an IP address for uh, where the session originated from and a username. So I'm going to show you what that looks like in a tiny little lab environment that I have set up. So here in this top system, I've got my domain controller. Um, here on this lower right system, I have this user, uh, Dave McGuire, who's uh, logged on to this computer here. So you can actually see uh, sessions or SMB sessions uh, using the net binary. So on the domain controller, I'll do net session. And right now I have uh, no entries in the list. But then on this system, if I uh, do like a, a net view against this, this is going to create an SMB session against DC 2016 001, which is this computer here. So I'll just view what, uh, what SMB shares I have uh, readable from, from this user context uh, against the DC. And then now if I do net session, oh, well, let me try that again. These are pretty ephemeral, so you have to catch them in time. So now, uh, so I have the username here and the user here is david.mcguire, which is the user I'm running as over here. And the computer that the session originated from is 231.101, which is going to be the IP address of this computer here. So that's, that's kind of interesting. But what's even more interesting is that if I am on another computer, let's say Jeff, let's say Jeff Dimmick is our red teamer. Um, Jeff Dimmick does not have admin rights on the domain controller. So if I try to dir the C dollar sign directory on the DC, for example, DC 2016-001, we can see that I'll get uh, access is denied. So I'm not an admin on the DC. But uh, using net session enum, which PowerView has uh, as part of its get net session commandlet, if I run that, I can see the SMB session that I created as Jeff Dimmick. But then if I do it in time, where Dave McGuire has an SMB session, I can also see from the DC, so I'm targeting the DC, I can see that Dave McGuire has a session uh, against this DC computer, and that session, that session is originating from this IP address here. So then if I can just resolve this IP to a fully qualified name, then I can determine that Dave McGuire is interactively, interactively logged on to this system here. And I did that without having admin rights on the DC and without having admin rights on the system here and without having admin rights on, on the system here on this, uh, 
this other system here. So Jeff Dimmick is not a domain admin. He's not a local admin on the system. So no admin rights required for any of that. So please feel free to keep uh, bringing your questions um, into the uh, Zoom Q&A. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Jared Atkinson now, and he's going to dive even deeper into this uh, session collection. So let me stop sharing, and Jared, you should be able to take over now. Alrighty. Thank you, Andy. Okay, so I want to kind of start talking about this idea called capability abstraction. So uh, there, there's a few different ways that we can approach kind of detecting this type of activity, right? So uh, Andy spoke about, or I guess the title of the, the webinar is Detecting Bloodhound, right? Um, but he kind of mentioned that Bloodhound is really just an analytical tool. It needs data. And so the thing that we're trying to kind of detect is that collection of data, really, right? So, you know, the, the anal analysis can happen offline and outside of the scope of our, our telemetry and our collection capability. So how do we, how do we detect that, that collection or that data collection? Um, Andy also mentioned that Sharphound is kind of the, the supported mechanism uh, from the Bloodhound development team for, uh, for collecting that telemetry. However, in his demo, he showed that Git net session is a PowerShell uh, function or even net, net sessions, right, is another, uh, another tool um, that would allow you to see this information, right? And so uh, it stands to reason that Sharphound is not the only tool that is capable of the, these, types of, uh, these types of attacks, right? Um, now, when we talk about detecting Bloodhound, uh, Andy spent some time talking about what is Bloodhound, like what is Sharphound actually collecting, right? So there's uh, an LDAP component where they enumerate computers, users, the domain, uh, groups, things like that. Uh, there's also kind of that individual uh, computer component or the client computer component where they are enumerating who's logged on where. Um, and, and typically when we're kind of approaching this capability abstraction, we want to pick one of those things to look into kind of at a time. Um, so you could have kind of two approaches. One is how do we detect Sharphound, right? Which is a tool that implements a number of different techniques. Or how do we, how do we detect the individual techniques which can be implemented by numerous tools, right? And so you kind of choose the path that you want to go down. Um, and there's, there's certainly pros and cons to, to either approach. Um, now this idea of capability abstraction is uh, these tools are really just abstraction layers, right? So they, the idea of writing a, a tool for an attacker is to make something more uh, like easier to interact with, more automated, all that kind of stuff, right? But underneath, there's, there's a lot of different things that are happening, right? And so um, one of the things, kind of our approach to how we want to detect things is to understand what's happening underneath that, that initial tool layer. And so some questions that I might ask uh, are focused on techniques. So if we're looking at Sharpound, what techniques uh, are involved in Sharphound and which ones specifically are we, are we interested in tackling, you know, first or next uh, as, we, as we look into this? Uh, then, then we want to look at tools. So we're kind of take, like picking our head back up and saying, we've identified in this case, uh, we're going to look into kind of that net session enumeration uh, technique. Um, and so we might ask, what tools do we know of that actually implement uh, that technique? Each of those tools may have a different approach to implementing that technique, and it's really good for us to be able to kind of analyze that uh, from the perspective of each of those tools. Uh, after that, uh, we, part of the analysis is understanding what functions, what API functions are actually enabling uh, those tools to do what they, they do. So Andy, Andy discussed the net session enum uh, API function. And so that, that's an API function. Basically, the operating system makes that available for developers to perform uh, that query uh, in kind of an easy and supported way, right? And so there's a number of different functions. There may be other functions that provide similar capability, and we want to we want to understand that so we can understand, you know, what are all the different ways that an attacker can can do this. We may then want to look into uh, how do how does this technique or this attack interact with different files or registry registry keys or things like that. Um, and then lastly, one thing that I I think is really good to look into is does this technique require network activity to occur? And if so, can we, can we figure out kind of what that looks like, right? Um, as we go through, again, for the technique, uh, we're going to focus specifically on that net, network session enumeration kind of approach where an attacker is trying to see who's logged on where. Um, the reason why this is valuable for attackers, as Andy mentioned, is this gives them an idea of if, I need, if I've enumerated, you know, who has access to where, right? So we say, okay, 
I want to get access to a domain administrator so I could have, you know, get on a DC. Uh, I need to know where those domain administrators are logged on um, so that I can go and steal their credentials. Um, but as we're going through this, we're specifically, I'm going to focus in the context of this webinar on what are some tools that perform net network session enumeration? What are some API functions uh, that, that are involved in that? And then what does the network component look like? And, and kind of once we understand all of that, we can start to evaluate uh, what types of telemetry and what our approach for detection might look like. Okay. okay, so I like to kind of visually build out this abstraction. So we're saying user session enumeration is what we're looking for. Currently, we don't really know much about it, right? Um, so we want to look into what are some tools that we might, we might look into. So uh, we already talked about Sharpound, right? So Sharpound is the supported uh, collection mechanism for Bloodhound, and that performs session enumeration. Andy demonstrated GitNet session, which is a PowerShell module from, or a PowerShell function from the PowerView module, uh, which uh, he demonstrated. Uh, there's also a tool called NetSess, or NetSesh, I don't know, I don't know how it's supposed to be pronounced, uh, that performs this capability. And then lastly, there's a, another tool called bloodhound.py, uh, which is just a different approach to kind of that Sharpound collection. Um, I'm sure there are, there's, you know, technically infinite number of tools that can be, that can perform this technique. These are just four that kind of provide some good talking points that allow us to go through this. The, the way that I would go about collecting like a list of tools that perform this technique might be uh, to just kind of Google around, look, uh, try to see if there's anybody talking about uh, doing Bloodhound type uh, collection without using Bloodhound, for instance, and kind of go from there. Okay. So uh, I'm going to build this out, uh, starting kind of with Sharpound, and then as we as we kind of go, we'll introduce different tools and show show how they differ. Um, and so, if we're looking at Sharpound, uh, there's actually a pretty pretty decent detection rule um, that Florian Roth wrote for the Sigma Sigma uh, project, where he's specifically looking for Bloodhound hack tool. Um, and so when he's saying Bloodhound, he's he's referring to the Sharpound component. Uh, but specifically, what he's looking for is this idea of a command line that contains dash collection method all, right? So, um, again, there's, there's this idea where uh, you, can, you can target a tool or you could target a technique. This detection specifically is targeting a tool. Um, so now, now, some people may, may be critical of targeting tools. However, um, I think it's very valuable to kind of take those easy wins when you get them. Right, and so if somebody's going to use the default version of Sharpound, uh, we might as well uh, detect it in the easiest way possible and in the most precise way. So that command line argument of dash collection method all is probably fairly unique to uh, Sharpound. And so any alerts that are produced from this tool or from this detection uh, are going to be you know, high fidelity. Um, where, where the problem comes in is if, if we don't understand that Sharpound is just one implementation of how to go about performing these techniques. We now have uh, issues because we're, we're kind of blinded to what the different alternatives are, right? So Florian understands this. He's just providing kind of like a 80% solution, uh, but we, could, we need to go further to kind of understand how, how do we solve that other 20%. Okay. Um, okay, so we've kind of talked about maybe you, you have this approach to detecting tools directly. So like a Sharpound detection, maybe there's a, a PowerView detect or a GitNet session detection uh, using like PowerShell script block logging, something along those lines. Uh, but let's see if there's any layer of abstraction that, that we can pull out that kind of shares uh, similarities between these two tools. Okay. So what I like to look at is what are the actual API functions that are being referenced? So there are kind of like the operating system or Windows, Win Windows API functions that we might want to look into, uh, but also in situations where there's managed code, uh, we, may, we may need to kind of have an extra layer of abstraction. So uh, Sharpound is written in C Sharp, which is uh, a managed code that's built on .NET uh, or managed language. Um, and GitNet Session is built or written in uh, PowerShell, which is also built on .NET. So we might look into are there .NET classes or methods that uh, are being called there? Additionally, we might say, you know, what unmanaged functions, uh, so like API functions, are being used by these tools uh, that we previously identified? Um, maybe we're interested in what DLLs export these functions. So when you when you want to call an API function, you you must first import or load that DLL into memory of that process, and so that may be valuable for us. 
Also, uh, are there any alternative functions that can be called that perform similar or uh, similar, similar kind of functionality? And then are there any native or undocumented or underlying uh, functions that we're relying on? Okay, so here's, here's uh, kind of a snippet of code from Sharpound. And this is where that net session enum function is actually being referenced, right? So this is, this is uh, through kind of like a technique in uh, C Sharp code called platform invoke. And this allows us to reference unmanaged functions, uh, net session enum, which is coming from this net API 32.dll uh, module. And it allows us to actually call that. Now, similarly, in Git net session, uh, they're using uh, kind of like a, a different module called PS reflect, which allows you in PowerShell to do platform invoke type, uh, type calls, but all in memory, right? And so ultimately, uh, there is not a .NET class that is being used in these, in these two tools that allows us to enumerate these, uh, these network sessions or these user sessions, okay? And so ultimately, uh, we end up with this idea of platform invoke being called or being used to call uh, net session enum API, okay? And here's, uh, again, Andy showed this earlier, just the, uh, the document, documentation for the net session enum API function, and specifically that the DLL that that is exposed by is called net API 32.dll. All right, so what I like to do again is kind of update my, uh, I call this my abstraction map. And this is, uh, as you see, there's a, there's a lot of black areas in the abstraction map. Uh, hopefully we'll fill those in as we go and kind of understand this a little bit more thoroughly. Uh, but right now we know we have Sharpound and GitNet Session. Both of those use uh, Platform Invoke to ultimately call the net session enum function from netapi32.dll. Okay, so what about if we introduce netsesh.exe? So netsesh.exe is, uh, is not written in a managed language. I actually, I actually don't know if it's uh, C or C++ or what the language is, but it is not uh, built on .NET. And so Certainly, it's not using platform invoke because it doesn't need to. Um, and so maybe we want to look into net sesh and see kind of how, how that's performing the similar functionality. Um, and so one thing we could do is we can basically put this in a, uh, a PE parser, right? And we can look at what functions are imported into this portable executable net sesh.exe. Um, you'll notice that it also is uh, basically referring to net API 32.dll. And it's specifically loading up net API buffer free and net session enum. So we see that there's a, a similar similarity here between all three of our tools. And that similarity is built around net API 32.dll uh, and specifically net session enum. Now, what I wanted to do is there, there's kind of multiple ways that we can go through this analysis. So for, for those that are familiar with like uh, reverse engineering, there's kind of this idea of dynamic analysis, which is let's just run, run this thing and kind of observe what happens. And that's, uh, that's certainly one way. And it's typically you get some really quick wins uh, from that methodology. But there's also kind of this uh, static analysis component where you actually go in and uh, open up the binary and start looking into what's, what's going on. And so when we're talking about learning about abstraction or detection engineering, both dynamic analysis and static analysis are tools in our tool bag that we, that we should use. So one thing that we might do is load up uh, net API 32.dll in IDA and go and see how this function actually works kind of under the hood, right? So uh, we load that up and here on the exports tab uh, for net, net API 32.dll, we can go and see that there's a, an export, exported function called net session enum. This is that API that everybody's referring to to collect this information, right? When we click on that, you double click on it, you ultimately end up uh, seeing, seeing that there's no actual code being referenced for, by that function. In fact, it's actually, uh, they call this a forwarded export. And this is uh, basically calling a function called net session enum from a DLL called srvcli.dll, right? And so um, one al alternative that an attacker might, might have is they might be able to skip calling net API 32.dll altogether and instead call srvcli.dll uh, and kind of bypass, let's say, let's say you've written a detection that says, I wanna see anytime that netapi32.dll is loaded as a module in a process, and I want to you know, do some further analysis on that. Uh, well, if I just refer to srvcli, uh, then I'm going to bypass that, okay? All right, so now we have uh, kind of two API functions. Um, 
One is, you know, net, net API 32 net session enum. The other is SRV CLI net session enum. Let's go look at that SRV CLI implementation and see kind of what that looks like. So this is, this is what I ended up seeing once I opened that up and here's the code. Uh, ultimately what we, what we could kind of do to simplify this, these, these here are the arguments that were passed into the function. Um, and we, we can go and look for anywhere where there's a, a call basically. And so, uh, ultimately, we see that there's a call to an imported function called NDR client call four. And so maybe what I want to do is go see, hey, what does NDR client call four do, right? And so again, NDR client call four is a documented, well, uh, a very lightly or sparsely documented function. Um, and ultimately, what I want you to kind of key in on is that this is related to RPC, remote procedure calls. And the DLL that, that it comes from is RPC RT4.dll. And so now we know we're dealing with probably some RPC calls, which might be, might be interesting to look into going forward. But we've kind of enumerated out uh, this idea of we have uh, net, net API 32 net session enum, SRV CLI net session enum, and RPC RT4 NDR client call four to go, to go through. Okay. So what happens if we have this? kind of fourth approach, which is bloodhound.py, right? This Python implementation of kind of a similar sharp hound type functionality. And that's built on this, uh, this library called Impacket, or it, it, this functionality specifically is built on uh, this library called Impacket within bloodhound.py. And so we wanna go and kind of look into that. And so of course, uh, bloodhound.py is on GitHub. So one quick, quick win is to just go in to GitHub and use the search functionality to say, hey, is net session enum referred to in this code anywhere? Um, and so it came back and said, nope, we don't see net session enum at all. And so that kind of makes me think, okay, well, how are they achieving uh, this functionality in a different way, right? And so uh, I wanted to dig into that a little bit further. Okay. Um, now, one thing that we can do is we can start going through and take a different, different approach or kind of gather a bit more information. So you'll notice that these are, so for func uh, API function documentation, you have kind of a return value, which is this client call return RPC var entry. You have the function name NDR client call for, and then you have arguments, right? And so the first argument is this P stub descriptor, which is a, uh, a pointer to a middle stub descriptor structure, right? And so what I wanted to do is go and look at this middle stub descriptor structure. And I noticed that, you know, there's a lot going on here, but one of the things that that's kind of interesting and sticks out is this RPC interface information uh, kind of uh, structure there. And so when we start to build that out, what we do is we look at NDR client call four, and we look at the last uh, argument that's pushed onto the stack, right? This offset uh, here, and we can actually lo start looking into what it actually looks like, right? And so uh, we, we open up that offset and we see that it uh, has a, a D word there and we start to kind of pull that up and we we get some information well ultimately this information is there's a size value here and then we see uh, a GUID value right and we we ultimately this is a trick that Matt Graber kind of kind of showed me recently uh, but we are ultimately are able to pull that GUID out and we can look at that value and that, that value is going to going to refer to something that's related to RPC and so uh, what I did is I literally uh, started started documenting that, and then I uh, then I Googled it. Now uh, another approach. Let's say we're not comfortable. Like I'm not super comfortable with pulling that all out. Uh, I referred to a lot of uh, a lot of what Matt Graber was showing me, and so another approach is to use this uh, kind of dynamic approach, right? So there is a Microsoft Windows RPC provider for ETW, and you can enable that um, and kind of do this this dynamic approach where you execute this functionality. And then you go and see kind of what, what was logged and what can we pull out of that. And so you'll notice that uh, we see this same interface ID, uh, UUID here. Um, and we have, additionally, we have this opnum, right, which is opnum 12. And so that might be specifically interesting. Uh, we also see that there's this name pipe, SRV SVC. And so that may, that may come back to be valuable to us later on. Okay. So, so we have this interface uh, ID, which is this GUID. And we also have this opnum, uh, but maybe I want to look into that a little bit more. So what I did is I literally just plugged that GUID into, uh, into Google. The idea of a GUID is that it's globally unique. So hopefully if I put it in Google, I'm going to get something that's, you know, somewhat unique. 
And ultimately it points us to this, uh, this documented protocol called the server service remote protocol. So if anybody's ever heard of the, the server service on Windows, that's what, uh, that's what this is talking about. And that's what is actually being used behind the scenes when we make these RPC calls. Okay. Um, and so now we, we kind of are updating our map and we're saying, hey, this, this GUID is referring to the server service remote protocol, uh, but we possibly want to look into this a little bit more deeply. Um, within that documentation, there's a reference to this opnum number 12, uh, which is an RPC procedure, right, called net R session enum. So it's very similar to our net session enum API function, which is an operating system function. Uh, but this is an RPC procedure, which is uh, kind of that network request function uh, that is net R session enum. And if you if you were to go back and compare uh, the arguments to net R session enum and the arguments to net session enum, they'd be very similar. Okay. Um, so if we if we return back to bloodhound.py, uh, kind of the interesting aspect of this is that bloodhound.py uses this impacket library to directly call net R session enum, uh, the RPC procedure. And so they actually bypass the entirety of all those API, like operating system API functions that we kind of looked into earlier. So they don't call, they don't call that uh, net API 32 net session enum. They don't call that uh, SRV CLI net session enum. They don't even call that NDR client call, right? So they're just uh, putting, making that request directly on the wire and they're bypassing uh, those detections. And this is, this is why it's starting to become really valuable for us to understand that abstraction layer because uh, now we understand the value or the, the kind of give and take of creating detections at different layers uh, of our abstraction map. Okay, so ultimately here, here we have this idea of four tools, Sharpound, Git Net Session, Net Sesh, and Impacket, and kind of where the overlap of these detections are, right? So we could build a detection for each of those tools individually, and, and there's, there's certainly value in doing that, right? But ultimately you, it's going to be somewhat impossible to build a detection for every single possible Implement tool implementation that can ever exist, right? And so we want to supplement those tool detections for known tools with uh, kind of technique-based or more abstracted detections, right? And so that might be something like building detections for modules being loaded or for API functions being called or for uh, RPC, RPC requests over the wire. So, uh, so we're able to kind of compensate for the lack of our ability to predict every single tool implementation that will ever exist. Okay. Now, uh, RPC is interesting, right? So it's a client server uh, kind of, kind of uh, functionality, right? And so uh, we know that there's a client, srvcli.dll, um, but what about the server side of that, right? And so uh, Matt, Matt Nelson, one of our colleagues at Spectre Ops, he, he happened to, I, I actually like plugged in that GUID into Google and his gist came up on GitHub. And basically what he did is he went through and kind of enumerated all the default uh, RPC servers that are on a Windows 10 installation. And so uh, he did that using James Forshaw's uh, NT Object Manager uh, module in PowerShell, which has this great Git RPC server function. And then he produced this, uh, this text document. And so notice this is our RPC server interface, right? Our GUID. And it says that it's being implemented by SRV SVC.dll. So the client side is SRV CLI and the server side is SRV SVC.dll. And you'll notice here we have opnum number 12 as net R session enum. And so possibly what you could do is say, okay, well now I could go look at SRV SVC.dll and see how the server side of that RPC relationship is kind of handled. So that, that's outside the scope possibly of our time frame for today. Uh, but that might be something that uh, you can spend some time looking into if you're so inclined. Okay. And so we just add that kind of update our RPC interface uh, portion of the abstraction map, and then we kind of move forward. So again, in a client server relationship, it doesn't necessarily have to involve network activity in kind of the traditional sense of one computer talking to another. Uh, it could just be local, like a local client server relationship in a process communication for those that are familiar. Um, however, in this case, Andy specifically defined that uh, the way that this was beneficial for an attacker is for me, me as the attacker on one system to be able to enumerate sessions uh, that are associated with other, other computers. And so like one example of uh, how they would go about doing that is look for like a file server, 
uh, well, a file server has every, tons of computers throughout the environment have SMB sessions with the file server. And so if I can enumerate sessions on a file server, a remote file server, I'm going to, I'm going to stand to uh, get tons of information, tons of value about where different users are logged on throughout the environment. So um, there, there's likely a network component in this attack that we're specifically thinking about right now. Um, and so some questions that I might ask are, does this technique require network connectivity? I think the answer is yes in the context of the technique that we're interested in. What ports and protocols, et cetera, are used? Um, and then what specific details about the protocol can be used to differentiate this activity from other possibly benign activity? So in general, the server service is, exists because it needs to be used for something, right? So like Microsoft added it to Windows uh, for, for a reason. And so you can't, we can't just say, oh, somebody's using the server service, so, so it must be bad. Uh, we specifically probably want to evaluate the difference between good and bad uses of the server service. Okay. Um, now, if we go back to our documentation of the protocol, uh, we specifically see that uh, there's a name pipe involved. And so Andy mentioned that uh, this activity takes place through RPC over SMB. Um, and so specifically at that uh, RPC over SMB is going to refer to a name pipe. And the name pipe in this case is the SRV SVC pipe. And so one thing that we might be able to do is look for any processes connecting to the SRV SVC named pipe. And that would at least allow us to infer that uh, some sort of uh, server service request is occurring. Okay. Um, and so this is kind of our, our final uh, abstraction map here. So we have some ideas of possibly doing tool-based detections, looking for some indicators of platform invoke being used uh, specifically to uh, allow that net session enum function to become available. Uh, we have some, some modules and functions that we might be able to look for loading and calling. We have uh, an RPC interface being referred to, and we have a name pipe uh, that we're looking at. We could also uh, approach this from the network aspect, right? And so uh, generally, this, these all boil down to ultimately calling that RPC uh, procedure net R session enum. Um, and so we might be able to collect information. And I, I'm showing a Wireshark capture, for full packet capture. It doesn't necessarily have to be the full packet capture. There's a lot of great tools out there that, that look at metadata um, and are going to give you enough information to figure out what's going on. And so um, here we see that there's a net session enum request through Sharpound. We see that get net session also has a net session enum request. We see that net sesh.exe also has this net session enum. And so the next, the next thing is like, oh, cool, bloodhound.py is probably going to have this net session enum request, right? And, uh, and so the network is going to be the end all be all. Well, that's what I thought um, until Andy ran this and he ran this this morning so that, so that we could have it. Um, and we ended up seeing that bloodhound.py actually uses MPAC. It has a uh, SMB3 portion of the library uh, that, that provides encrypted SMB traffic. And so we're not actually able, I, I don't even know if this is specifically that net session enum or net R session enum request. However, uh, there is no clear text net, net R session enum RPC request in the bloodhound.py traffic. And so this is another instance of uh, maybe, maybe you look at three different tools and you say, okay, every single instance of these tools uh, gets, us back to, uh, gets us back to this net R session enum request. Uh, and then we, we find a fourth tool and that tool uh, is different, right? And so um, I, think, I think one of the ma major takeaways is that there's probably not one solution for any specific technique detection, right? And so, I think that's literally my next slide. So some of the some of the takeaways that we that we want I want uh, for you viewers to kind of take away from this abstraction idea is that uh, the best place for detection is dependent on your monitoring posture, right? So um, maybe we'll answer this more formally in a second. But I saw one of the first questions was, "Hey, are are real bad guys running uh, running Sharpound because it's kind of noisy?" Well, no, like noisy is in the eye of the beholder, right? So uh, similar to how Andy described that Bloodhound uh, needs data to provide value, right? So you have to collect the data before Bloodhound can do any analysis. The same thing can be said about enterprise defense, right? So if you're not collecting telemetry, then you have no context of what's occurring in your network, right? And so uh, an attacker can be as noisy as they want um, and it doesn't matter, right? Um, 
but what what is based on my experience working with numerous organizations what's noisy to one company or one organization is not noisy to another right so it all depends on the types of telemetry they have where that where that telemetry is being collected from what way it's being collected that type of thing so um I guess the, I, I don't know necessarily if I have data to say whether atta real attackers are using this. Um, I think it's probably safe to say that real attackers are using similar functionality or this technique in general, uh, but maybe not sharp pound. Maybe, maybe they are using sharp pound. I don't know. Um, the other idea is don't rely on a single detection analytics. So at the beginning I showed uh, Florian's uh, bloodhound detection and that's a, that's a great detection. It's probably going to solve the problem 80%, right? So you've, you've uh, detected the default use case of Bloodhound. However, as, as many people on this webinar know, it's relatively trivial to change, change what that looks like, right? So if anybody's familiar with like the Invoke Obfuscation project, you've seen how, how trivial it is to uh, obfuscate command line arguments, um, how easy it is to re-implement that, that functionality in a different way. And so we want to make sure that we're kind of addressing this problem from uh, multiple, multiple perspectives. Um, another one is always strive to understand as much about the attack as possible when developing detection logic. And so uh, your, your first thought of how to detect a, an attack technique is probably not bad, but it's probably not comprehensive, right? And so we want to spend some time getting to, getting to know or getting familiar with the attack technique and knowing how it works under the hood. Uh, before we we claim that we're detecting it in a comprehensive way um, and then you know take easy wins when possible so if there's something that's like a very direct uh, detection like literally a, a hash detection for a known bad tool that's not bad right um, it's just not comprehensive it, the, these kind of simple detections they only become bad if that's the only approach that's being taken right i think i think generally they're good uh, because they're low cost and they are high fidelity, right? So like the chance that you have uh, a hash collision is relatively low. Um, and so, so you kind of take that win when you can. And then there, uh, the last one is there's likely not one answer that covers everything. As, as we talked about, um, there's a network component, there's a module loading component, there's a name pipe component, there's a uh, API function call component, there's a PowerShell component, there's uh, you know, a tool focused component. So, there's uh, tons of different opportunities for detection of these types of techniques. And I think this, this, that logic stands in every technique that's, that's possible for an attacker to use. Um, so that's, I think, the end of what the prepared content is in the, in the webinar. Um, I saw some things flashing while, we were, while I was talking, so I assume that means <laughs> you could hit us up at username, at, <laughs> at username on Twitter or user at mail.me. Um, we'll, you're, we'll fix that. that it's, it's fixed. Oh, okay. Apparently it's fixed and not my version. Um, so, so I think at this point, Justin or Andy, we're going to go ahead and answer some of those questions. Is that the plan? Yeah. So I think Jared, I think Justin brought up a good point. It'd probably be good to answer the more defense centric questions first. Okay. Um, which I think those are going to be your ballpark. So I'm going to stop sharing. Is that okay? So that I could pull this back up. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I guess I'm just going to kind of pick out what I'm going to start at the top. So I think I think I kind of that first the first question, I think I kind of tried to address it. I don't have any data to uh, to tell me whether or not real APTs are using Sharpound per se. Um, but I think it stands to reason that the idea of enumerating user sessions is probably something that uh, real attackers are doing. And so Sharpound is uh, is a is a tool for you know, us as trusted entities to do that. Uh, but it also is a tool that helps us kind of analyze how this functionality is, is done and try to build more in-depth detections around it. Um, the, there's a question about, uh, does traffic sent over secure LDAP uh, use a unique TLS client fingerprint for like JAW3 type detection? Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I've never, I've never tested it. Um, it might might be interesting to look at. Um, yeah, I, I don't know enough about to answer that properly. Um, what domain control or event log code should be looked at in order to determine possible bloodhounding? Yeah, um, well, so 
I think the the question is basically what what like built in event IDs can we can we refer to um, to find this type of activity? Uh, off the top of my head, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, I what I what I liked it so like one of the one of the kind of situations that we find ourselves in as consultants is uh, every every client is using different telemetry, right? And so like it it stands to reason that like Windows security event logs are probably the most ubiquitous. Uh, but a lot of organizations actually don't even centralize those logs in a way that that would be referable. Um, so when I give kind of generic guidance, I like to kind of give it um, in like a, you should look for possibly module loads occurring uh, for the modules that we discussed, like srvcli.dll or, um, or like name pipe connections occurring, like connecting to SRV SVC name pipe as opposed to uh, specific kind of very specific uh, event codes and things like that. Uh, how much does the value go down if SMB 445 is closed at the workstation? I, yeah, I can, I can answer that. Okay, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the, um, so the question is how much does the value go down if SMB 445 is closed at the workstation? It's a really good question. Um, so Sharpound will by default try to read, local group memberships and user sessions and that does happen over port 445. However, it is possible to get all the same information um, from just a certain subset of systems. So for example, if if the organization is using GPO restricted groups to add principles to local groups on uh, computers, Sharpound will do the logic to figure out what computers a GPO applies to, and it will make the connections from what principles are being added through restricted groups by that GPO to the computers that that GPO actually applies to. So even if on those computers 445 is closed, we can still determine with fairly strong confidence what the minimum set at least is of principles that are added to local admins, remote desktop users, um, distributed comm users, uh, et cetera. And then the other side of that is user sessions. So if you have 445 closed on everything, then certain things are not gonna work. So Jared mentioned um, file share servers. Um, obviously, if, if, a, if, a file, if a file server is gonna be hosting files over SMB, then 445 needs to be accessible to that server from most, if not all, of the enterprise. Um, same thing with domain controllers. For, for several different um, functions of Active Directory to, to, to work properly, the domain controllers have to have 445 open to everything that is joined to the directory. For example, you have to be able to read group policy files um, uh, at the sysvol, which that's going to happen on port 445. Because those um, requirements are there, it's it's extraordinarily rare, and I have never actually seen it, where an organization will close 445 on DCs, file servers, or really anything. Um, I, I've seen maybe two organizations that have limited inbound traffic on 445 to the majority of their endpoints, um, but it's, it's an extraordinarily rare circumstance. Um, so the answer to your question is, um, it doesn't really degrade the value that much um, because the information is still going to be accessible um, uh, even if even if 445 is closed on all those different endpoints. Uh, here's another question. Oh, go ahead, Jared. Oh, so there's there's a question about monitoring, uh, like auditing, allowing blocking sp sensitive RPC opnums uh, on the client or server side. Um, and they specifically are saying that with SMB3 encryption, it seems like kind of the, the network portion of monitoring might be a little incomplete. So I was specifically kind of talking about uh, monitoring on the, the client, like the, on uh, the host or endpoint kind of layer. And so uh, as I, I kind of breezed over, but I showed uh, ETW has an RPC uh, provider, which monitors for client and server, uh, server calls. And so that may be an option. Um, I know that kind of implementing ETW in production has been a struggle for a lot of organizations. One thing that one thing that we like to do is kind of identify uh, 
what is a thing that we should look for? So for instance, API monitoring, like saying, okay, anytime anybody calls net session enum, um, we want to know about that, right? So somebody, somebody asked a question that was along the lines of, that's very hard to do, right? So like that API monitoring. Um, and so like, do you know of any good tools? Um, I think, I think the, the reality is, is that uh, API monitoring is happening all the time, right? So for instance, a Sysmon even ID 10 is monitoring the open process API call, right? So it, that is API monitoring. It's just kind of wrapped up in a, in a pretty, pretty box for you. Um, I, think, I think the value of doing this abstraction mapping is not necessarily saying, hey, like today I can convert this uh, need to monitor for the net session enum API to, to an actual alert, is to identify that, hey, it might be valuable to be able to monitor for this. And then like, you know, most, most organizations probably don't have the, the capability to build out enterprise logging uh, tools to monitor for that. And so maybe that's a, a thing you could talk to your EDR vendor or, you know, the Sysmon team and say, Hey, it'd be really awesome if uh, we added, you know, net session enum monitoring uh, to the next version of the, the product or whatever it is. Um, for kind of this idea of like, can we allow blocker audit? Um, there is a there is a PowerShell script called NetSeese uh, that basically allows, and this is very specific to the net session enum. I don't know how how broadly it would work for like all RPC opnums, right? Um, but for net session enum, there's NetSeese, and basically what that does is it changes the uh, the security descriptor to uh, disallow authenticated users to uh, request this this information. And so that that might be kind of that middle ground that says like, hey, we we need to leave four four five open, uh, but we don't want just like any arbitrary uh, authenticated user to request session uh, information. And I don't I don't know this for sure, but I imagine that you could add a sackle um, on that. You, you can add a sackle on that security descriptor that basically says, I want to know when somebody is doing that. So that might be, that might be a really interesting thing to look into. I don't Andy, do you know if, have you seen anybody try to play around with sackles for that? I have not. No. Cause there, there's, there's also like, there, there is value in preventing, right? So like, obviously if we could prevent attacks, that's really valuable, but like just because an attack was prevented doesn't mean that I don't want to audit it. Right. So like if somebody tried to, uh, request session session information uh but was prevented from doing that it's still valuable for me as you know a defender to know about that because that that may be indicative of other attacks that are possibly going on in the network but yeah that might be that that might be interesting i'll see if i could figure that out later today and maybe i'll write a blog post on doing a sackle for that but yeah netcease is the place that if you google netcease that's a good place to look Uh, here's, a, here's a question I can answer quickly. So this question says, what has been your study process in order to draw out state-of-the-art access control abuse within a Windows environment? Was it documentation bashing or experimentation and previous experience working at Microsoft? Um, I think there's only one person I know of who's worked at Spectre Ops who worked at Microsoft as well, and that was Matt Graber. But um, otherwise, the people who were involved in the the access control uh, abuse research. Uh, none of us worked at Microsoft. Um, so that would be uh, myself, Will Schroeder, and Lee Christensen. Um, but otherwise, at, at least from, from my perspective, the uh, kind of primary inspiration to, um, to start digging into that was uh, this, this paper from uh, the French government uh, called Active Directory Control Paths. Uh, which went into detail about um, generic rights versus um, like extended rights, um, what you can do with things like full control. Um, so we we tried at first to kind of translate that paper from French into English, which didn't really work. Um, so um, after after a couple of months, we came back to it and. Um, just looked at like the technical details that didn't require translation and then kind of ferreted out what the things meant. And then um, there were several different uh, online resources that um, had great documentation uh, regarding discretionary access control in Windows, including the functional specifications on TechNet. And then, um, yeah, I'm not answering this very quickly, am I? Um, 
and then also the uh, uh, self ADSI uh, website goes into really good detail uh, about discretionary access control lists, access control entries and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's also been other work from other people who um, have, like, have revealed how to take advantage of certain uh, objects based on uh, abusable access control entries. Um, the, most, the most obvious example I can think of is uh, Elid Shamir's uh, resource-based constrained delegation research recently. So um, I hope that, hope that answers that question. Um, another question I can answer. So this, this question says, I run sharpound.ps1 as the binary version is automatically deleted by our antivirus. My question is, is there a way to automate running Sharpound and automatically push the data into the database? Uh, there is not. There used to be um, where we could uh, push data th through the Neo4j uh, Bolt API um, uh, and put it directly into the database, but that became, that became too, too difficult to maintain with the changes that Neo4j would introduce um, with each of their uh, releases. So uh, we, don't, we don't have that functionality in Sharpound anymore. Sorry, I was muted. There, there's one question uh, that I think is easy to uh, kind of work through. So I, I can't find it right now, but it's basically asking, hey, uh, is the API call, oh, does, does your map say that the Windows API method for session enum is also using RPC method below? Yes, yeah, so, um, and that's, that's what I was showing. Let me see if I could, uh, Here, Andy, can yeah. you scroll up? Yeah, yep. the, let's see, here we go. Okay, um, go up a little bit more, or if, let me see if I, I'll tell you what um, slide number here. 45, slide 45. Yep, so what this is showing is uh, basically there's this net session enum. This is net session enum from SRV CLI. Um, now remember that net API 32.dll is literally just pointing to SRV CLI net session enum. So that they're, they're equivalent. They're the same. Uh, but ultimately this is referring to NDR client call. Um, and so if we were to kind of like follow that path, which gets really convoluted and would have taken us way out of our time, our time that we had reserved, um, that would ultimately show us that it's calling uh, that net R session enum RPC procedure on the, on the remote end. So Yes, basically, net session enum is basically a nice little wrapper that sets us up to call that that RPC procedure at the end. Uh, here's another question. So this says, are you guys seeing any incomplete scans from running Sharpound 3.0 against a domain that has about 100,000 hosts? I ran the PowerShell script and the binary from an authenticated terminal and Citrix sessions. Both times I did not get zip results. So the largest environment that uh, that we have run Sharpbound in was 600,000 endpoints. Um, uh, and Rohan has been able to make improvements in Sharpbound to bring the total runtime for that environment down to approximately an hour, maybe two hours. Um, and it, it runs reliably every time. Um, every so often there is some funny thing with Active Directory that we've never seen before that will cause an issue um, with Sharpbound. Um, so what I would say the best thing to do is drop into the Bloodhound Slack and in the Bloodhound chat channel, um, bring this up and then provide whatever details you can regarding um, command line switches you used, um, any output that you got from the tool. If you're able to run it in debug mode, uh, that's also helpful. And, and we'll try to help if, if we can. Cool. Um, so another question was around kind of like monitoring or hooking RPC level. So I, I don't know if this is specifically asking about like network volume. Um, however, I think I think there's some some value um, in kind of talking about how frequently like this net net R session enum RPC procedure is called. Um, and so I was before like kind of in preparation for this. I looked at some network monitoring that some of our clients have. And we're talking uh, a Fortune 500 client over 30 days. And uh, I saw that the net R session enum uh, procedure was called like 13 times. So relatively infrequently, of course, uh, kind of that bloodhound.py method, right, would have bypassed. That wouldn't be included in that, but that, you know, should be exceedingly rare uh, in normal operations, I would imagine. Um, and so 
you know, I think, I think if you're able to monitor for net, net R session enum on the wire, that's probably going to be a pretty, pretty decent uh, indicator or something that's worth looking into. Uh, there are some, maybe some ways that you can make that higher fidelity or more valuable or, you know, have more meaning. And so maybe if you identify the type of system that's being uh, enumerated, that might be, that might be interesting. So for instance, I, I mentioned that, uh, and Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a lot of value in uh, enumerating sessions on file servers. And I, I, I think that that, if I remember correctly, that's the like stealth approach for Sharpound is to only look at um, file servers instead of every computer in the, in the domain. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, DCs and then um, uh, computers that are, that are identified in like um, uh, home path um, parameter on user objects. Gotcha. Typically going to be file servers. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. So yeah. So maybe uh, identifying what those computers are. Basically, where where are computers that you expect a lot of users to log in via SMB? Um, and then kind of maybe that's a higher fidelity or maybe like a more critical alert that you you would want to respond to. So I like RPC in general is going to be extremely noisy if you are just collecting it indiscriminately. Uh, however, specifically looking for that net R session enum uh, procedure is going to be, at least in the small sample size that I have, going to be relatively infrequent. You see any other like defensive centric questions you want to answer first, Jared? Okay, let's see. I'm just kind of scrolling through real quick. So one, so like one question is, do you know if Peen Castle uses net session enum? I, I don't, I don't know that, but I'm, I mean, I could go. I don't know that either. I guess uh, Peen Castle is open source, isn't it? I believe it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me go see what I go ahead and answer another question, Andy, if you have one and I'll see if I can. Sure. So this question says any good tips for running sharp pounds stealthily with PowerShell? For example, running PowerShell v2 to avoid script block logging. I've also heard about net only. Does that matter? So um, PowerShell v2 um, will evade script block logging and will also evade the anti-malware scan interface. Um, so if .NET 2 is installed on the endpoint, then you can use PowerShell v2 for that. Um, but uh, what you can also do is you can, you can load and use PowerShell scripts completely in memory and never touch the disk, um, which can be really good for evading um, antivirus detection. Uh, and then what I would also say is that uh, sharpound.exe, uh, you can also run in memory um, using something like Cobalt Strike's execute assembly method, um, which will uh, load and execute the binary completely in memory. Um, and in my own personal experience, I've, I've never had AV or EDR uh, catch that. Uh, the caveat with that is my red team experience is pretty old now. It's probably about 12 months out of date. So you want to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, here's another question. This is a great question. So compared to all other LDAP traffic, how heavy is the query from Sharpound? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, I would certainly say that Sharpound collects a lot of data from LDAP. I think you're, you're talking about megabytes of LDAP traffic um, for a moderately sized environment. How that compares to other endpoints, um, that would be, that'd be an interesting thing to look at in like a Splunk interface, for example. Um, just have like uh, LDAP talkers maybe sorted by how much um, traffic each of them has generated over the past 24 hours. My assumption is that a computer that has run Sharpound would pop to the top of that list. Um, but I, I have not done that personally. I think that would be a really cool experiment to see just how loud Sharpound is compared to other LDAP talkers. And again, my assumption is that it's very loud uh, compared to others. Okay, so I, yeah, I just looked at Peen Castle. I, I'm not gonna say definitively that it does not use net session enum, uh, but I, I don't see it uh, being used. However, Peen Castle is again written C-sharp, so it's using that platform invoke uh, to call in 
other uh, API functions like net share enum, which would allow you to enumerate network shares, um, which is also comes from that net net or net API 32.dll. So, um, and also uses RPC, right? So it's, it's going to be very similar in, in look, but maybe for some reason he's not specifically using net session enum. Um, but that's, that's just in like a two minute review of it. So it looks like we, we got time for two more questions and then we're going to call it good. The other questions that we don't get to, we are going to answer um, in a follow-up email. So if we didn't get to your question here, we, we will get to it in an in a email. Um, let's see. There's a lot of really good questions. It's, it's hard to pick like one to focus on right now. Here's, here's a question. So is there a vast difference in the data collected running Sharpound with domain admin versus domain user rights? So for information that comes from the domain controllers, by default, you will see no difference because all the data that we read from the DCs is by default able to be read by anybody who's authenticated to the domain. So that, com that comprises the vast majority of information that, um, that Sharphound collects and that winds up in the Bloodhound database. There was an important change with Windows 10 and 2016 anniversary update, which came out in 2016. Uh, where the, the default security descriptor for the, uh, the, the SAM RPC server changed so that you have to be an admin to read the local groups on endpoints remotely. So that change made it so that if you're running just as a domain user that is not a local admin, you're gonna be missing out on, on that information if you can't read it from somewhere else. Uh, for example, GPO, which Sharpound can do. And that's, that's if those local groups are being controlled by GPO. So the answer to your question is it depends. Um, but for the most part, you're not going to see much of a material difference from the red team side. You're still going to find attack paths if you are just running this as domain user uh, and not as a domain app. Uh, Rohan, did you want to jump in to uh, add anything to that? No, you covered it pretty well. OK. Uh, Jared, do you see one last question you want to answer before we wrap this up? Yeah, let me just, let me look real quick. Um, so there, there's a couple questions that I think I kind of like tangentially uh, referenced that I, I just want to hit real quick. So one of the questions at the top is, uh, we talk about, we're talking about Sharphound and Jester, but what about blood, bloodhound.py? Uh, same idea for detection, assuming same telemetry. I think, I think we, t I don't know if that question was asked before we got to that point in the, in the talk, but just to kind of follow back up, um, Bloodhound.py is very similar. One of the major differences is that it, call, it calls the RPC procedure directly. And so there are opportunities for client side detections uh, for Sharpound that would not be valid for Bloodhound.py. Um, but there, there may be kind of alternatively detections for Bloodhound.py that aren't, uh, aren't available for Sharpound. So for instance, if you detect a process, uh, this is going to be like, this would be a correlate correlation detection, but if you see a process that's making an RPC request to the net R session enum uh, RPC procedure that does not load up net API 32.dll, then that would certainly be suspicious because they're kind of bypassing the way that Windows or Windows wants you to do it. And so uh, a lot of people probably don't necessarily have that capability, but it's something to kind of think about. One of the one of the really and so uh, I guess what I was about to say is an answer to another question, I guess. So uh, one of them was, what would be your preferred way of monitoring these API calls? I struggle there. I think that that ultimately is a, a major struggle for a lot of people. Um, and I, I kind of tangentially touched on this a little bit earlier, but ultimately I think, I think the reality is, is most organizations, a, a, there's probably not like a great that I know of, uh, like straight API uh, monitoring tool. And if, if there was, it would be extremely noisy and probably a lot of organizations wouldn't be able to handle the volume of data that's coming in. Um, however, as I kind of touched on, there's, there are like API monitoring is something that, that is happening kind of underneath the hood on a lot of EDR anyway, right? So like 
uh, Windows Defender ATP has open process API monitoring. It has read process memory, write process memory, um, quite a few other ones. Um, Sysmon has, has it with uh, even ID10, which is open process. And so uh, this is kind of one of those things to where I think, I think as we start to understand these tools a little bit better, we can start to kind of create demand for that monitoring. I think it's, it's very difficult for us as, you know, practitioners to build enterprise tools. There's like, you know, literally companies dedicated to that, that are worth lots and lots of money. And so uh, part of it is as, as their customers, right. We can create demand that basically says, Hey, it'd be really awesome if you have this. And that's why one of the like major kind of like indirect benefits of this process is abstraction process is understanding where that benefit is. And that makes you kind of a more empowered customer. Right. And so the idea is it's like, vendors are going to tell you, you need X, Y, and Z. And if, if you don't know any better, then you're going to be like, okay, cool. X, Y, and Z sounds good. However, if, if you've gone through these abstraction maps and you say, okay, well for network session enum, we have a good solution for detecting RPC on the wire. Um, but we don't have like, what about like that encrypted SMB, SMB three traffic that, you know, kind of bypasses that network network detection. It'd be really nice if we had an, an ability to uh, detect like, uh, R RPC traffic uh, or RPC requests, right? Um, well, once you've established that, now you can go to these vendors and say, hey, uh, it, I, like, I don't necessarily, your, your demo that you have prepared is really cool and that gives me some information, but I specifically am interested in talking about what you do to monitor RPC calls. Um, can, you, can you tell me about that? And then you know, they either can or they can't. And then you, you get that feedback, right? So it makes you more empowered because you know specifically what it is that you're lacking or what you, what you would find valuable, right? So um, that's kind of like a, it's kind of a cop out a little bit on the answer, but hopefully, hopefully that provides some value in like the thought exercise, I guess. Cool. All right. Thanks everybody for joining. We are going to make a recording of this available as soon as Zoom finishes processing the video and the deck as well, we will share out the questions that we were not able to get to, we will answer in a follow-up email. And uh, thanks again for joining us and uh, hope everybody has a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks guys.